March 28th, Daily Video Bible Reading from the Net Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 21 and 22 of the Old Testament. If a homicide victim should be found lying in a field in the land the Lord your God is giving you, and no one knows who killed him, your elders and judges must go out and measure how far it is to the cities in the vicinity of the corpse. Then the elders of the city nearest to the corpse must take from the herd a heifer that has not been worked, that has never pulled with the yoke, and bring the heifer down to a wadi with flowing water to a valley that is neither plowed nor sown. There at the wadi they are to break the heifer's neck. Then the Levitical priest will approach, for the Lord your God has chosen them to serve him and to pronounce blessings in his name and to decide every judicial verdict. And all the elders of that city nearest the corpse must wash their hands over the heifer whose neck was broken in the valley. Then they must proclaim, Our hands have not spilled this blood, nor have we witnessed the crime. Do not blame your people Israel, whom you redeemed, O Lord, and do not hold them accountable for the bloodshed of an innocent person. Then atonement will be made for the bloodshed. In this manner you will purge out the guilt of innocent blood from among you, for you must do what is right before the Lord. When you go out to do battle with your enemies, and the Lord your God allows you to prevail, and you take prisoners, if you should see among them an attractive woman whom you wish to take as a wife, you may bring her back to your house. She must shave her head, trim her nails, discard the clothing she was wearing when captured, and stay in your house lamenting for her father and mother for a full month. After that, you may have sexual relations with her and become her husband and she your wife. If you are not pleased with her, then you must let her go where she pleases. You cannot in any case sell her. You must not take advantage of her since you have already humiliated her. Suppose a man has two wives, one whom he loves more than the other, and they both bear him sons, with the firstborn being the child of the less loved wife. In the day he divides his inheritance, he must not appoint as firstborn the son of the favorite wife in place of the other wife's son who is actually the firstborn. Rather, he must acknowledge the son of the less loved wife as firstborn and give him the double portion of all he has. For that son is the beginning of his father's procreative power to him should go the right of the firstborn. If a person has a stubborn, rebellious son who pays no attention to his father or mother and they discipline him to no avail, his father and mother must seize him and bring him to the elders at the gate of his city. They must declare to the elders of his city, Our son is stubborn and rebellious and pays no attention to what we say. He is a glutton and drunkard. Then all the men of his city must stone him to death. In this way you will purge out wickedness from among you, and all Israel will hear about it and be afraid. If a person commits sin punishable by death and is executed, and you hang the corpse on a tree, his body must not remain all night on the tree. Instead, you must make certain you bury him that same day, for the one who is left exposed on a tree is cursed by God. You must not defile your land which the Lord your God is giving you as an inheritance. When you see your neighbor's ox or sheep going astray, do not ignore it. You must return it without fail to your neighbor. If the owner does not live near you or you do not know who the owner is, then you must corral the animal at your house and let it stay with you until the owner looks for it. Then you must return it to him. You shall do the same to his donkey, his clothes, or anything else your neighbor has lost and you have found. You must not refuse to get involved. When you see your neighbor's donkey or ox fallen along the road, do not ignore it. Instead, you must be sure to help him get the animal on its feet again. A woman must not wear man's clothing, nor should a man dress up in women's clothing. For anyone who does this is offensive to the Lord your God. If you happen to notice a bird's nest along the road, whether in a tree or on the ground, and there are chicks or eggs with the mother sitting on them, you must not take the mother from the young. You must be sure to let the mother go, but you may take the young for yourself. 
Do this so that it may go well with you and you may have a long life. If you build a new house, you must construct a guard rail around your roof to avoid being culpable in the event someone should fall from it. You must not plant your vineyard with two kinds of seeds, otherwise the entire yield, both of the seeds you plant and the produce of the vineyard, will be defiled. You must not plow with an ox and a donkey harnessed together. You must not wear clothing made with wool and linen meshed together. You shall make yourselves tassels for the four corners of the clothing you wear. Suppose a man marries a woman, has sexual relations with her, and then rejects her, accusing her of impropriety and defaming her reputation by saying, I married this woman, but when I had sexual relations with her, I discovered she was not a virgin. Then the father and mother of the young woman must produce the evidence of virginity for the elders of the city at the gate. The young woman's father must say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man and he has rejected her. Moreover, he has raised accusations of impropriety by saying, I discovered your daughter was not a virgin, but this is the evidence of my daughter's virginity. The cloth must then be spread out before the city's elders. The elders of that city must then seize the man and punish him. They will find him 100 shekels of silver and give them to the young woman's father, for the man who made the accusation ruined the reputation of an Israelite virgin. She will then become his wife and he may never divorce her as long as he lives. But if the accusation is true and the young woman was not a virgin, the men of her city must bring the young woman to the door of her father's house and stone her to death. For she has done a disgraceful thing in Israel by behaving like a prostitute while living in her father's house. In this way you will purge evil from among you. If a man is caught having sexual relations with a married woman, both the man who had relations with the woman and the woman herself must die. In this way you will purge evil from Israel. If a virgin is engaged to a man and another man meets her in the city and has sexual relations with her, you must bring the two of them to the gate of that city and stone them to death. The young woman, because she did not cry out, though in the city, and the man, because he violated his neighbor's fiance. In this way you will purge evil from among you. But if the man came across the engaged woman in the field and overpowered her and raped her, then only the rapist must die. You must not do anything to the young woman. She has done nothing deserving of death. This case is the same as when someone attacks another person and murders him. For the man met her in the field, and the engaged woman cried out, but there was no one to rescue her. Suppose a man comes across a virgin who is not engaged, and overpowers and rapes her, and they are discovered. The man who has raped her must pay her father fifty shekels of silver, and she must become his wife because he has violated her. He may never divorce her as long as he lives. A man may not marry his father's former wife and in this way dishonor his father. God, you, you know better than anybody that this chapter, these couple chapters in here are one of the big chapters that gets everybody riled up. Who's not Christian or hasn't studied your word in depth? Things were a little bit different back then for a woman than they are now. In some ways that's good, in some ways that's bad. I'm not going to go into it, but I think one of the key points is you weren't forcing a woman to marry her rapist. And that is one of the big things that we need to take off the table right now. Back in Exodus uh, chapter 22, you say if the father refuses to give her to him, then he shall have to pay that money. Uh, understanding that back then a woman lived in her father's home and until she was betrothed, her father controlled her actions. Once she was betrothed, then, then her husband took over as head of the household at that point. So I doubt seriously that almost any husband, sorry, any dad out there is going to hand over their daughter to the rapist. They're just going to take the money and then the guy isn't going to get a wife. However, as we get further into the Bible, we do read accounts in 2 Samuel specifically about when Amnon rapes his half-sister Tamar. 
and we see a story where Tamara actually possibly wants to marry Amnon. Uh, again, understanding how valued virginity was back then. Sadly, it's not anymore in our <laughs> in our world, but back then it was incredibly highly valued. Um, also, a woman didn't have much choice unless she was married, unless somebody took care of her. So these these laws that you provided, God, that if she ends up marrying her rapist, he is required by law to take care of her for the rest of her life. Many women who were out of their father's home for whatever reason and weren't married uh, either died or had to go into prostitution. There was there was nothing like jobs for women back then. There was no way to support themselves. And so a single woman out from underneath the authority of her father, uh, a widowed woman, a uh, lot of situations, a lot of problems in there. So I, I, I do love reading the Old Testament, but I think, and I pray for the people listening, we've got to understand that even though we're reading your word, God, and it's incredibly powerful, we need to figure out what it is that you're really saying here. Are you saying if a rapist rapes us, then we have to marry him? No, that's not what you're saying at all. In fact, you're setting up provisions because back then there weren't provisions for women. You were actually taking care of us in the best way possible that either our dad was going to get money for that situation so that he could continue to support us for the rest of the time there. It would be difficult for us to marry after we were raped or the rapist was going to have to take care of us for the rest of our lives. And because of these provisions and so many of these laws do have to do with provisions, uh, land statutes, how we went in, how they went into battle, um, handling situations with each other. All of these were set up to simply take care of us, to simply help provide us an opportunity to not have all of these different distractions of the, of the world, but instead give us an opportunity to focus on you and, and what it is that you were offering us, a, a way to walk in your path and be obedient to you. And I love as we get into the story of Ruth, we actually start to understand some of these little bit odd sounding laws to women of today. We start to understand them in the significance of the story of Ruth, which is one of my favorite books in the Bible. Thank you for taking such good care of us throughout history. So many people who aren't of you, God, try and twist your words and, and make malice out of different Bible situations or pull certain verses out of the Bible and try and use them against us. And I just so appreciate studying your, your word and understanding the history and the culture at that time and, and seeing how all these thousands of years in different opportunities, these still apply, these truths still apply to my life. God, you're just amazing. In your son's name we pray. Amen.